I will talk about uh, uh, our research concerning uh, ultra-fast events in uh, mostly molecules and how we employ uh, multiple laser pulses to uh, explore what is going on uh, on a molecular scale uh, and at very fast times. Now, if you take a minute to think about, uh, let's say, the time scales that are available for us to, uh, let's say, think about. We have astronomical time scales. And every time when you think about a time scale, you can visualize a device that, that, that helps you to um, explore the processes taking place on that time scale. So if you think about astronomy, well, the closest measuring device that uh, helps us to explore astronomy is a calendar. Uh, then uh, if you think about human lifetimes, and this is actually a, an animation that's been around since I was a student. <laughs> they have not grown up yet. They're still alive and kicking, the South Park. Uh, yeah, and uh, so then you, you, you can use a, a watch or a clock uh, to time the processes, uh, for example, of yourself walking to a bar. Uh, then uh, you have cellular events and uh, also fast reactions in the atmosphere, such as lightning. For that, you can, uh, to, to time that, you need a fast camera or maybe electronic equipment. And as you progressively go smaller in the time scale, so from galaxies all the way to uh, molecules, and maybe atoms even, uh, also your, your time resolution required to explore the, the related events uh, becomes, uh, has to be faster and faster, yeah? Because uh, the lighter the object is, the faster it will move. That's a, a simple thing. Try moving a heavy bus very fast and you will see that it's difficult, at least a lot more difficult than you know, wiggling a hand about or something. All right, so if you enter the realm of uh, molecules, uh, then uh, the related times on which these things operate, they, they also enter the realm of uh, nano, pico, and femtoseconds. And uh, for that, even electronics is not fast enough. It can cope with uh, many picoseconds, but not with uh, single picoseconds, and definitely not femtoseconds. And for that, you use lasers. You use light to, uh, to actually monitor and time these events. Uh, similarly to uh, when you want to observe a hummingbird, a motion of the wings of the humming, hummingbird, if you use a conventional camera to, to take a picture of a flying bird, uh, you see that the motion of the wings will not be captured by it because uh, wings move many times during the exposure of the camera and uh, hence they are blurred in the picture. Uh, but if you have a very fast camera that can make several thousands of frames a second, you can actually uh, photograph the flight uh, with uh, the wings being frozen and then reconstruct the motion or at least gain some understanding uh, of how these things work. All right, so we are not interested, we are interested in birds. <laughs> that, uh, I mean it uh, metaphorically, uh, and we are men in this case. But um, it doesn't matter. We will, let's talk about molecules. Uh, molecules are interesting, and we, we need light pulses, uh, very fast laser pulses, to actually observe the events taking place in the molecule. For that, uh, we have a tra traditional experimental technique called pump probe spectroscopy which is uh, essentially uh, an uh, application of two very short light flashes onto your molecule. F the first one starts whatever this molecule is doing, so it, you need to provide it with some energy to, to start its operation, so to speak. And then the second pulse uh, comes in after a while and measures where this molecule has arrived, so to speak, and it's on its reaction pathway. And uh, my talk today will uh, briefly explain this and then extend this into the domain of um, multipulse transient spectroscopies where you not only excite and then watch what's happening but also uh, you have an additional laser pulse to actually perturb this molecule while it's doing its job and from the result of that perturbation you can actually deduce uh, what is going on with this molecule. So uh, I will start with briefly um, explaining you what the signals look like and how you can visualize these photoreactions, the light-induced reactions in molecules, uh, by uh, means of some balls moving about. 
OK, so uh, let's say you have a number of molecules. Normally, they sit in, the, in what is called their ground state, so non-excited state, they're in thermal equilibrium, some energetic minimum on ground state poten potential. If you apply some light on these molecules and they absorb this light, some of them uh, tr are transferred into the excited state. The excited state is, is a state which has excess energy, uh, and that means it can do something with that energy. The molecule can use this energy to do something normally useless, but sometimes also useful. So uh, these molecules that appear here, they disappear from here. So if you look at the ground state absorption spectrum of, of, of the sample, after you have transferred the molecules from here to here, you will have a lack of absorption in the ground state. So if you had an absorption spectrum that was peaking somewhere here, let's say at 450 nanometers, uh, the difference absorption, meaning excited minus non-excited, will have a feature that, is, that will correspond to, the, correspond to the absorption spectrum of the ground state, only it will be negative. It will be something that's missing from the absorption uh, spectrum that you can measure. Uh, in addition to that, these molecules, when you arrive with your second laser pulse to measure the absorption spectrum of the sample, they can do two additional things. One thing is they can actually be transferred even more, even higher into the higher excited states. And that will correspond to some absorption that was missing from the original sample when, when everything was sitting here. But uh, after you excite it, some signal, some absorption signal will appear corresponding to the excited state absorptions of the, uh, absorption of the molecules. All that will be a positive signal, an absorption that appears, that was not present, but then appeared here. And uh, it will peak at some wavelength we don't know where, we don't specify yet where. An additional signal or additional process that can happen with these molecules when you apply the second laser pulse is stimulated emission. That's the basis of laser operation. We all know that uh, if you uh, apply a photon onto an excited atom or molecule, doesn't matter, uh, in resonance with the energy gap between the excited and the ground state, you can demote these molecules back to the ground state. So that's called stimulated emission. And in the process, these molecules generate additional photons. Eh? So you come in with some light, and you get more light because you have these molecules in the excited state producing additional light. Well, producing additional light is, can be viewed as... Uh, yeah, as a disappearance of absorption. Eh? So it's, uh, the sample absorbs less when it's excited because it's amplifying your measuring light. And so you also have a negative signal uh, roughly corresponding to the fluorescence spectrum of the molecules, uh, of the molecules that, that you have been investigating. So this is a negative replica of a fluorescence spectrum times omega to, the, to some power. But normally in the, in the electronic spectroscopy, this, this, the shift due to this multiplication is not significant. So we might as well forget about it. OK, so now let's, uh, if these molecules are doing something with the energy that you have provided them, of course they will evolve on this, on this excited state potential. Eh? So they will move somewhere. And then, uh, since the energy gaps between the ground and excited state and also between the first excited state and the second excited state will be different, uh, then uh, these signals will shift about and will, all, will hold the information about what's happening to this molecule. What, what is this molecule doing? When is it going back to the ground state? Because it will eventually probably go back to the ground state, and so you will gain your signal back. So, Traditional pump probe, in other words, to summarize what I've just showed, is uh, basically a way of monitoring the difference absorption spectrum as a function of time. And the, dynamic of the dynamics of this uh, difference absorption spectrum will provide you, with femtosecond time resolution, if you have the, the, the appropriate lasers for that, uh, will provide you with the information of what's happening uh, with the molecule after you excite it. So to reiterate, your signal in pump probe is comprised of ground state bleaching. So that's the absorption that's missing from the sample because you excited some molecules. Stimulated emission, which normally peaks a little bit to the red from the ground state bleach, just because of the Stokes shift. Excited state absorption, which uh, will be additional absorption bands appearing due to the fact that you can now re-excite these excited molecules uh, higher up. And maybe, maybe, if this molecule is doing something useful, for example, giving away an electron or receiving an electron, or maybe it's isomerizing, changing, changing its structure, maybe you will have absorption bands uh, due to the photoproducts. Uh, and that's uh, essentially the productive bit of the reaction we are talking about. 
So conceptually, the experiment scheme is very simple. So you need two femtosecond light pulses, one to excite the sample, the other one arriving with a uh, certain delay after the first one. And the delay in the femtosecond realm means that you have to let this pulse propagate a little bit more distance. So that's not really difficult to implement. You just put a mirror on a mechanical translation stage, move it further back, and if the light bounces back and forth, it already traveled a bit more after you've moved it. So that's OK. And uh, you can, it's, it's, it's normal used, extensively used in many places in the world to probe processes like uh, uh, excitation energy transfer, photoreaction dynamics, internal conversion, meaning uh, how the molecule is giving away its excitation energy to the vibrational degrees of freedom, intersystem crossing, when the molecule flips a spin of the excited electron, solvation dynamics, how the solvent molecules, if you have a, a molecule dissolved in water, for example, how water molecules uh, shift a little, uh, shift about a little bit to accommodate the the different and uh, electronic structure of the excited molecule. You can also look at vibrational relax relaxation. Charge transfer is uh, of a special interest because that's the basis of all the energy that uh, gets captured by plants and bacteria and stored in form of sugars. And uh, yeah, you can even make alcohol out of that. So it's very important for the student. Uh, science conference. And uh, okay, so now you look, if you look at, at, at the data of such an experiment, normally what you see is something like this. There's a lot of data, and it's not, I mean, these are spectra as a function of uh, delay time between the two pulses and uh, also, uh, yeah, the two different polarizations. Uh, of course, it's impossible to look at it. Well, luckily, we have uh, these nice uh, uh, computer graphics programs that can make a nice carpet. And that's a lot nicer to look at, but still not very informative. Because if you look at the carpet, it looks, well, like a carpet. But uh, actually, since you are young people starting your scientific careers, I think a word of advice that I had from my advisor in my day uh, the more contour plots you produce, the bigger the sciences that you are making. So uh, make sure you have a lot of contour plots. Huh? So uh, that uh, helps to publish your paper. Maybe you heard a talk about it already. Contour plots uh, sell, like sex cells, contour plots sell in science. Uh, so, but we do a little bit, we go one step uh, further. We employ mathematical uh, methods to actually bring order into this uh, whole mess of many spectra. So how can you, uh, how can you describe a data set uh, that is essentially like this. So on one axis you have time, on the other axis you have wavelengths, so that you're measuring spectra, and a signal on the third axis. Well, you can uh, say that uh, your data is comprised of several populations evolving into each other. You postulate how they evolve. You don't know from, from beforehand, but you can postulate it. So let's say you have box uh, one evolving into, into box two, into box three, into box four, and so on. Maybe evolution is linear, so that would be very nice. So uh, a, a worm into a, an elephant. Well, I don't know how evolution took place, but it doesn't matter. But uh, you can also postulate a different connectivity scheme or a branched connectivity scheme, which is normally the case in, in, in the, when you talk about uh, photoreactive molecules. Then you solve the set of rate equations describing the population flow in such a scheme. And you use the parameters, so the rate constants, to actually fit your data. And then you postulate that your data is comprised of the amplitude of a spectrum attributed to each of those boxes, and uh, uh, let's say the time dependence of the population in each of those boxes. An additional assumption that you need is, is, is uh, that you initially put your population, let's say, in box one, maybe in box one and box two, you, you're free to choose. But after you do that, you basic, what you get is a, a set of spectra attributed to each box. And you can, if, if, you, if you look at it, you can, if your connectivity scheme is not too crazy, let's say it has five boxes in it, then you have five spectra and five time constants to worry about. You don't really have to worry about the entire carpet or uh, um, this bunch of spectra that I showed earlier. Now, OK, so that's for Pump Pro. The problem with Pump Pro, it's Normally ambiguous. It's like, yeah, it's like going uh, to a bar with your girlfriend. What will you have? Fish and meat, f fish or meat, fish or meat. Give me an ice cream. So that's, uh, uh, again, pump probe data normally shows you something, but not all. And sometimes it's impossible to decide between several models. You don't know how this excitation pathway is branched. And for that, to establish, to actually come to clear 
cut conclusions about how it works, then is when the additional laser pulse may be of use. So if pump probe results are ambiguous, dumping may give the answer. Don't take this to the personal areas uh, of relationships. Uh, dumping is not always the answer, but in our case it was, so I will uh, now uh, show you uh, how this can be used to determine things. Eh? So suppose now again you have this potential energy surface, you put some molecules there in the excited state and they start doing their job, sliding along the potential energy curve, which is multidimensional normally, but let's look at one dimension because the blackboard is, or the, the screen is, is two-dimensional. Now suppose you have a pulse that is in resonance with the gap between the excited and the ground state um, uh, at this time instance of the reactions. And you apply it and you remove some, some molecules from the excited state. And then, only after that, your molecules uh, reach the, let's say, the photoproduct state. Eh? So this is the, uh, it says transist, so that's drawn for transist isomerization, where the molecule rotates about one of its, one of its double bonds. But, uh, so basically, in this case, the application of an additional laser pulse, certain time after the first pulse has arrived, will produce an effect on the amount of the cis isomer that you will generate. So in, in, if the sequential photoreaction dynamics is taking place and you perturb it on the way, you will have an effect on the, on the uh, final photoproduct stage. Uh, and the product absorption spectrum will depend on whether your additional pulse was present in the, uh, during the experiment or not. Now, suppose you have a different connectivity scheme and they, in pump probe world, they, they actually could give identical description of your pump probe data, but so, so oh, Sorry, let's do it one step at a time. Whoop. Okay, so you put it there, and it, the branching point occurs here at this local maximum of the excited state potential. And suppose you're now applying the pulse that is in resonance with this bit, which does not produce a photo product. In that case, uh, well, you will demote some of the molecules back to the ground state, and you, may, you will be able to see it, but the amount of uh, finally produced photo product will not depend on whether this pulse was present or not. So that the additional knob in your experiment that you can tweak, that actually gives you, an, a, let's say, a degree of freedom which you can use to determine what kind of dynamics is taking place. And it's not always obvious from pump probe results alone. And I will show you some examples when uh, this actually helps to determine what's going on. So. Uh, we need to supplement our laser setup with an additional laser pulse that is in resonance with one of the uh, transient bands that we see in pump probe spectrum, either excited state absorption, maybe stimulated emission. So, and uh, uh, basically we can do many things. So if we excite the sample, uh, uh, we can dump the sample, then I will call this spectroscopy pump dump probe. So you excite it and you demote it back to the ground state. You have to obviously be in resonance with stimulated emission then. You can re-excite it to the higher excited states. That's called a pump repump probe. So uh, you produce the higher excited state during your experiment and you can uh, do a double pump probe experiment or you can actually excite the molecule, wait for it to relax and re-excite it again and see if it still remembers the effect of the initial pulse that it excited it. So you can do many things with this by changing the timing and the color uh, or the wavelength of the second pulse present there. You can also, uh, timing wise, you can play with the delay of the probe with the, keeping these two pulses fixed. That's called a kinetic trace. So that basically shows you the uh, allows you to compare uh, perturbed versus unperturbed pump probe dynamics with perturbation parameters fixed. You can also vary the perturbation timing, thereby sort of following when did these molecules, if you remember the branch connectivity scheme, if that occurred at a certain point in your experiment, by changing the timing of this uh, actinic, second actinic pulse, you can actually deduce when this decision took place in the molecules. Uh, that's called an action trace. And uh, you can also keep the first two pulses fixed uh, and have them identical wavelength. And then you can actually uh, do a excitation interaction study. So you put some excitations into the system, wait a little bit for them to, to equilibrate, and then you throw in some more and see uh, how, it, how it works. It's probably a little bit similar to a bunch of students uh, receiving a keg of beer. 
and then after a while receiving another one. Obviously, the results are very exciting. <laughs> yes, um, so the laser setup basically consists of a femtosecond laser system with parametric amplifiers uh, that allow you to get the right wavelength for both experiments. You need to be able to block and unblock both beams, and all three beams have to arrive at a certain point in the sample, and the probe beam, which is white light supercontinuum, uh, I will not go into the details here, uh, needs to pass the sample, intersect with, the, with those two uh, actinic beams in uh, time and space, and then be dispersed in a spectrograph for, uh, for detection. All right, so first application will be a green fluorescent protein. That's a protein present in a jellyfish called the Quaria Victoria in 2008. People received the Nobel Prize for it. It's a very nice protein because uh, it's basically, while folding, so you know, the biology stuff from school. Uh, the protein is made of a number of amino acid residues, and, and then it folds into a funky three-dimensional structure. But the nice thing about this one is that when it folds, it makes a chromophore, a, a group that can actually absorb and emit light in the visible uh, out of three amino acid residues. So basically, if you clone this protein into mice, into epithelium of mice, you can get green fluorescent mice. You put them under UV light, and you know, they fluoresce green. People have done it to pigs and monkeys even, so it's, you can make green fluorescent pigs and monkeys. And that's not actually the main application for this protein, uh, funny as it may seem. Uh, the, the nice thing about it is that you can actually genetically fuse it to any protein of interest that you want to monitor in a, in a cell. And then when you put these cells under the microscope, you have a, a, a purely pro protein, uh, non-toxic, non-organic dye, non-quantum dots containing cadmium. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a protein that actually acts as a fluorescent marker, and that's very nice because you can visualize what's going on in your, in your sample. That's uh, the, the molecule, the synthetic analog of the thing sitting there in this beta sheet barrel of this protein uh, that uh, actually is doing the, all the light-related job there. All right, so if you look at the absorption spectrum, you will immediately notice that, uh, at least in the, in the GFP, in the green fluorescent protein of Aquaria, the main absorption peak is, about, is at about 390 nanometers, and the fluorescence is in the green, as the, gene, as the green fluorescent protein uh, title would suggest. Now, why is this big stoke shift? Why is the fluorescence so much shifted away from the absorption? It turns out, and that people knew it a long time ago, that uh, it's because this molecule here gives away, uh, gives away a proton. Eh? So it, uh, when you excite it, it loses a proton. And you can actually see it from uh, looking at the emission appearance in the water versus uh, D2O. So if, if you make uh, hydrogens in your buffer two times heavier than normally, you can see that the fluorescence appears much more slowly in this green fluorescent protein. That was known before. So it, uh, it does excited state proton transfer, this, this protein. And that was, uh, that's what makes it fluoresce. So when you're excited, apparently makes a, a, a still excited but, uh, state, but without a proton. Eh? So, of course, after it fluorescents, it should uh, return to its ground state. And apparently, there's also ground state proton transfer taking place. And that's what we wanted to look at. So we said, OK, why don't we add a dump pulse here when, it's ha when it has formed this uh, proton transferred excited state? Let's remove all the excited state and see well, how the, the proton transfer takes place in a ground, plate, and a gr ground state. And that's actually a very important important uh, uh, biological reaction. Most of your metabolism is based on uh, molecules passing each other protons in, in the ground state. Uh, so it's not GFP, but uh, are different, different molecules, but still the reaction is uh, fundamentally interesting. So what uh, we saw when we did this experiment, well, basically, if you look at the stimulated emission band, so we, we excite the molecule, you see this emission growing in very slowly um, within, I don't know, 20 picoseconds or something like that. And then you arrive with a second pulse. And you see that a lot of this emission gets removed right away. And if you look at the, at the uh, wavelengths a little bit to the blue from the, from the emission, here you still see emission uh, or, and a little bit of bleach. But then when your second pulse arrives, it's replaced by a huge induced absorption. So basically what happens is you remove all the emission here, and you are left with the absorption of this state, which was, which was not observed directly before. 
So, and if you try and do that both in H2O and D2O, you see that the product that you, this is a different time scale, by the way, please note. So this, these are tens of picoseconds, these are all nanoseconds. So here you have this fluorescence appearing and then you produce this immense, immense absorption and that absorption decays with a time scale of about 400, 400 nanoseconds. If you do it in D2O, you can't even detect its decay. Well, maybe you can a little bit, but it star only starts to decay after four nanoseconds. So it cl clearly is a proton transfer reaction because the kinetic isotope effect is very, very pronounced. And uh, in, with hydrogen, not with deuterium, this proton transfer takes uh, about 400 picoseconds. So if anyone asks you how long does it take for, two for, for a molecule to, to do a proton transfer in the ground state, you, your answer should be 400, uh, 40 picoseconds. Don't forget to quote us. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, so we, we analyzed this data using this box model that I presented. So the boxes are now represented by lines here and the time constants that allow to describe the data well are also pictured here. And you can see this spectra. So this is the spectrum of the excited state. You see it has a, this nice stimulated emission band almost coinciding with the fluorescent spectrum. And this is the spectrum of this, uh, of this proton transferred ground state. Uh, so it has a huge absorption band peaking at about 470 nanometers. And uh, that decays with 440 picoseconds. By the way, these spectra are almost identical. So the dotted and, and the uh, solid lines here uh, are the ones representing uh, D2O and H2O. So it's the same molecule, just different uh, hydrogens. And you can see that these spectra are almost identical. So that's, that gives further credence that you can believe this model. Huh? So, OK, we said uh, since we were so lucky to publish this in PNAS back in 2004, uh, why, why, we, why don't we play around with the protein and try to do the same thing? So we took a mutant with, which has this uh, hydrogen bond network uh, rearranged. This is a wild type. This is a mutant. Uh, and uh, uh, one of these um, residues that was um, uh, fought to, to uh, basically play a, a, a significant role in this proton transfer process was uh, exchanged. So the uh, H148D, so the histidine to aspartate at position 148. Uh, it produces a little bit different absorption spectrum. And if you look at what's happening to the molecule and compare the wild type GFP with the mutant, you can actually see that things get a lot more complicated than you would expect from just exchanging a single uh, amino acid residue. So the growth of fluorescence is no longer so clear cut. So here is a wild type. You can see an isosbestic point where, where a proton transfer is taking place. So it's basically just one state represented by black here replaced by another state represented by dark green. Here is all, everything is a lot more messy and we don't know why that is. And if you then go and try to dump the, the uh, let's say, the proton transferred state of this, of this mutant, uh, well, you can see sort of similar effects uh, that you see in the wild type. You can see the, uh, that in some, at some wavelength, you, your dump pulse produces additional induced absorption. It diminishes the emission, so you are dumping something. But the dynamics afterwards is not so clear cut anymore, and we needed uh, sort of a scheme like this to describe it, we're not even sure if that's correct, but that at least gives you some idea about, about how this dynamic is take, dynamics is taking place. The funny thing in the mutant, though, is that it shows virtually, so in the parentheses here, you see the, the time constants uh, for D2O versus H2O. And here in, in the mutant, there is no difference if you have deuterium or hydrogen for some reason. In wild type, there was a huge difference, maybe 20 times uh, the rate constant. And here they're all very similar, 960 versus 1000, 250 and 295, there's not so much difference. So we didn't know why that is, and uh, we postulate, we don't know yet, we have not published this so far, but we think there's a, as a complex interplay going uh, on between the structural, uh, structural coordinate and the proton transfer coordinate. So apparently the wild type is sort of optimized to give away this proton very nicely, and especially optimized for the mass of the proton. But when, when you sort of perturb the network of these uh, amino acids, around uh, that hydrogen that needs to be removed from the, from the chromophore, uh, then you get uh, funny results. And apparently the protein is sort of breathing a little bit uh, to facilitate this transfer, and maybe that becomes a rate-limiting step in the proton transfer uh, process. 
Okay, I will switch gears and move to pyridinin. So that was GFP1 application where this additional pulse provided new insights and could actually uncover this hidden proton transfer state in the GFP. Pyridinin is a carotenoid, so I have to say a few words about carotenoids. These are the nice, the, the pigments responsible for the nice colors in nature. They color fish, birds, plants, tomatoes, and watermelons, and even red tides uh, are because of uh, carotenoids. Uh, the, you can even get them on the internet, uh, advertising that they will cure your cancer, but uh, I would not state place too much bet on that. Maybe see a doctor if you have a cancer. Uh, these are the molecules that have these, um, uh, 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 that have these uh, uh, chains of conjugated double bonds, and that's characteristic of all carotenoids. And pyridinin, well, this is a typical carotenoid. A carotenoid is from carrots, uh, that's beta carotene. Yeah, they use it to, as a food colorant, and you can find it in carrots uh, to a plenty. And it also does not cure your cancer, but a carrot or two will not do any harm too. So that you can, uh, don't worry about carrots, you can have them. We will talk about pyridinin, but first a few words about the excited state manifold of carotenoids. Carotenoid absorption is due not to S1 state, but S2 state. So they, they, they have an intermediate intermediate state between the ground state and the state responsible for the absorption, but that is optically dark. It's forbidden due to symmetry reasons, so you can only excite it to the second excited state, and then from there it does all the jobs. By the way, why uh, I, I neglected to mention that carotenoids, besides uh, coloring uh, birds, fishes, and whatever else to nice colors. They're also important for us because they help plants to do their photosynthesis, and that's probably more important than, ha than having nice birds. But uh, uh, they, they act as light harvesting pigments because they absorb at the wavelength region where, where chlorophylls have uh, no absorbance or very little absorbance, so they help uh, plants to, uh, and algae to collect the light that they need to do photosynthesis. So you can excite it uh, to the second excited state, uh, and then it decays to the first excited state, and then back to the ground state, and that normally takes about 10 picoseconds. So now pyridinin is a funky carotenoid. It doesn't only have the, the conjugate, conjugated double bond chain, but it has all these funky oxygens popping about, and it's uh, uh, found in algae. I forgot the name. Well, it's some Latin name which you will not remember anyway. Um, uh, okay, but uh, these algae use it as a main light harvesting pigment, and uh, that pigment is actually, where is it? Yeah, that's, uh, it's embedded in this protein called PCP, that's pyridinine chlorophyll protein, and it basically is a protein containing a number of pigments, the job of which is to collect solar light and to pass it to the reaction center of this algae, alga, and uh, to help it do photosynthesis. Okay, uh, back in 2001, uh, my colleague uh, and, uh, and a study mate from, here, from the olden days, Donata Zygmantas, who is now in Lund, uh, discovered that this pyridinin uh, carotenoid has a, a pronounced emissive charge transfer state. Uh, it, basically, it features emission in near infrared if you put it in polar solvent or if it's in protein, but if you put it in a hexane, which is a greasy solvent, then it has no emission whatsoever. So we said, okay, let's investigate a little bit how this additional state that appears in polar solvent, how is it related to S1 and S2 state of this pyridinin? It turns out that if you dump pyridinin when it's excited to, the, uh, to this ICT, um, charge transfer state, uh, initially your spectrum, uh, your spectrum uh, loses some of its features, but not others. So here there is no change, here is a, there is a big change, and the same with a different color excitation, that doesn't matter for the moment. But if you wait a little bit, this, the resulting spectrum becomes the same as the original Pompro spectrum again. That means that you preferentially remove ICT state from this carotenoid, you dump it down to the ground state, but then at some point it gets replenished from the other states that are ex coexisting with the state at the same time. So you can see the equili dynamic equilibrium uh, basically uh, taking place. So imagine two barrels of water connected by a hose, and you take a bucket of water from one, so initially the water level is a little bit lower in, in, this, uh, in this bucket, in this barrel where you took some water from, but eventually it equalizes again. So that's what we observe, observed, and our bucket of water was an additional laser pulse. Huh? So, okay, we did some analysis, again, with boxes and time constants, and essentially came up to this model that you're excited to a two state, it's, uh, 
takes an intermediate step to reach ICT state, which is in equilibrium with S1 state. And then if you remove that, you see this equilibrium being re-established in your data. So that we published back in 2006. And then we decided to look uh, at the protein. So where, when you put this molecule inside the protein where it's actually doing its job for, of light harvesting, uh, what happens then? And OK, I'm running out of time, but uh, we looked at different wavelengths corresponding to the carotenoid bleach, carotenoid S1 uh, and ICT excited state absorption. This is the emission band with, that we dumped. And that, this blue uh, feature here in this carpet, I remember my advice about contours. The more contours, the better science. Uh, uh, it's uh, corresponding to the chlorophyll that is supposed to receive energy from these, uh, from these carotenoids. If you dump it here, you see the emission of this ICT state being depleted immediately. And you can actually see that after the dump, some of the population is trying to come back. This is not, it's not decaying in the same way as it's decaying here. The slope sort of hesitates here a little bit. So that means that basically S1 state is feeding the excitation to this ICT state and uh, sort of replenishing this equilibrium while or at the same time uh, transferring energy to, to, uh, to chlorophylls and doing its job as well. So if you look at the S1 state, it's, uh, again, similar story. The, the amplitudes are a little bit different and we have an idea why that is. For the chlorophyll region, this bleach band here, which represents the amount of excited chlorophyll, initially, when you remove excitation from, from ICT state, nothing happens with the chlorophyll. That's, that's sensible, right? Because chlorophyll is not pyridinin. You dump pyridinin, why would chlorophyll care? But it turns out that, as in economics, when you take away money from one person, then after a while, the other person does not receive it. So in the end, you do have effect on the chlorophyll. So that means this ICT state is transferring energy to the chlorophyll. And that's the effect uh, that sort of uh, takes a little while to reestablish. And uh, after a while, you can actually see that you have removed some population which otherwise would have reached chlorophylls. OK, I will, uh, we need to. Uh, we need to account for the chlorophylls being present in the sample now. So if this looks complicated, get this. Huh? That's, uh, and you have to have a time constant corresponding to each of the arrows that you draw here. But basically, we did that. We think we can describe the data. And the funny thing that we observe is that actually S1 doesn't even need to have an energy transfer pathway to the, to the chlorophyll to describe the data. So maybe all of the energy actually goes uh, around to ICT and then to the chlorophyll. Uh, excited state. So that's the way this carotenoid helps the algae to collect the solar light. Uh, okay, these are the spectra attributed to each of the components. I will not comment on that because you will probably have a hard time uh, already. Now, another thing that we tried, and I will be very brief about this, we explored the Highlander story. The Highlander story uh, is the multiple excitations present in the, in the complex where you have several, of, uh, several pigments excited. These excitations can, reach each, uh, can find each other there. And then uh, this pigment on which they meet will be promoted to the second excited state, which is normally very short lived and relaxes back to the first excited state. In the process, you lose one of them. So they are like this Highlander mover, movie. They meet each other, they fight, and then in the end, there's only one left. Uh, so that's the, the, my impression how this works. So you, you have donor and acceptor. Uh, and uh, this is a simple energy transfer. But if you have an acceptor already excited, so you, uh, it goes into the excited state and then relaxes back. So in the end, from two excitations, you have only one. What we tried to do, we threw in some excitations with one pulse, waited for them to relax, and then threw in with another pulse and tried to see whether the energy transfer to the excited acceptor proceeds at the same rate as to the ground state uh, acceptor. And to our surprise, we did this for two, two different samples. This is the same PCP as I, as I spoke about earlier, a number of peridins and a chlorophyll. And this is a synthetic analog, so it's a porphyrin attached to a chlorophyll. Uh, to cut a long story short, if you look at the dynamics induced by the second pulse, you do not find additional kinetic components in this dynamic. So 
in other words, if you have an excitation sitting on, on a, an acceptor, it does not in any way change the energy transfer rate from the donor to this acceptor. If there's an excitation sitting here or not, doesn't matter. We are surprised about this. This shouldn't be the case from first principles, at least not the way we see it. Maybe it's a coincidence, but then it's a funny coincidence because we saw it in two systems. The same goes on in this carotene porphyrin diet. And uh, we don't know why that is. Uh, maybe we will be uh, more successful understanding this in the future. And I will summarize that uh, basically in having an extra knob to play with uh, allows you to get extra knowledge from your sample, which may be hidden in a conventional pump probe experiment. You can actually sort of retrieve it by adding additional laser pulse, getting a bit more data, and being clever about analyzing it. And thank you for your attention, and I wish you a very pleasant conference here in Vilnius. My colleagues. <laughs> uh, what about other types of uh, pre pump, like let's say uh, pre excitation, for example, by electric field, additional or magnetic fields? What what could be what other techniques could be useful for for signal uh, processing systems? Well, uh, okay, we are laser people, so of course, not, not lazy, laser people. Uh, so of course, we like to stay in our laser labs, and then uh, additional laser pulse is not that difficult. Eh? But of course, if you want to determine, for example, if you have an inter-system crossing pathway or triplet production in any way, maybe due to triplet fission, of course, the role of this additional pul uh, pulse uh, could be transferred to, let's say, to a, to a big magnet eh, being on and off. And uh, since triplets uh, have different uh, magnetic properties than, uh, than from singlets, then you could expect uh, producing additional effects there. Of course, uh, it's, a bit, uh, yeah, it's a bit more tricky to have, it, uh, have your magnets switched on during the reaction. That's probably not going to happen if you have a, little, a, a large coil and you want to uh, switch on the current uh, with the femtosecond time resolution, that's probably not going to help. But of course, every degree of freedom that you can throw into your experiment, depending on what you're trying to determine, I think that will be useful uh, for one situation or another. So, yes, thank you for suggestions. Uh, yeah, it's well known that uh, in this pump and probe experiments, uh, the very sensitive point is uh, to choose the right intensity of the pump uh, pulse in order to avoid uh, the nonlinear uh, response, like pre singlet, singlet annihilation, or other things. So, how you are uh, providing this uh, uh, right intensity? Well, okay, uh, good question. Well, that's related mainly to the last bit of my talk, which I ran through very quickly. Well, if you can't convince them, confuse them, says my colleague, or uh, if you can't beat them, join them. So the, the, what we did here, we actually used the, explored the annihilation to actually measure whether the uh, energy transfer rate is the same uh, when the acceptor is excited or not. And actually, it turns out that there's, there's a number of nice studies by, by a group here at the Institute of Physics in Vilnius uh, where they use the annihilation as a tool to determine the energy flow in, in different systems. Some, of course, many times, we, from biologists especially, we get uh, these uh, suggestions that it would be best to do all these laser experiments with light completely off. That uh, then with the sample is the happiest and is not degrading and the excitations are not annihilating. But it's always a trade-off. So either your, your signal is not big enough, maybe if it's big enough, if you can sometimes trade the intensity, the, the pulse energy that you use uh, to a repetition rate. So you have uh, smaller signals overall, but you have uh, more pulses to work with to get the same signal to noise. But then, of course, you have to ask yourself a question is, are you not damaging your sample by applying repetitive pulses? 
and so maybe it's worthwhile to hit it hard and then let it sort of uh, undergo surgery and come back to its senses uh, than hit it very often but very but weaker. So it uh, it depends. But of course we always check, uh, let's say, cross check our data for for nonlinearities for sample degradation and we do a, a energy. Uh, well, at least we make our students to do energy dependencies. They probably lie about them because, of course, it's impossible to measure with very weak light intensities. But yes, we, you have to worry about these things, and it's uh, uh, yeah. Sometimes you have to keep them in mind. If you can't completely avoid them, maybe you can make them your friend to actually determine something from these nonlinearities about the system that would otherwise be unavailable. So that's basically the strategy that we like to use.